Hello, it's Matthew here from the Nations of Sanity Project. I'm just sitting down to have a conversation with Robbie Miles, who's a representative in England for the Live and Let Live Project. Um, and we're going to have a little discussion about our respective projects um, and about the principles um, that are involved, which is obviously kind of libertarian principles, as many know, or anarchist principles or voluntarist principles or whatever label you want to put on it. The devil is obviously in the detail and it's best to understand the principles that we're working from and how we think we're best to go about achieving those and we both have projects that we're involved in that are working on that and I thought a great way um, to kind of explore the best way forward for everybody that wants a free society is to kind of mutually scrutinize our various ideas and explore these um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation and uh, welcome Robbie for and thank you for having, taking the time to have this conversation. Thank you Matt it's really kind of you to have me on and always nice to chat with you. Thank you. Yeah, we did have we've had a previous conversation, which I was almost gutted that we didn't record because I felt it was so interesting. It almost deserved to have a wider audience than just us two. But um, but yeah, that's another reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you now from a channel. Um, perhaps to just kick it off, do you want to do a little brief introduction to yourself and to the Live and Let Live project? Um, and then we can and I'll do a little one for me on the Nations of Sanity afterwards, and then we'll kind of kick on from there if that's if that's okay. Yeah, happy to. Um, so Robbie Miles is my name and I've been living in the UK most of my life, grew up in the Norfolk Broads and interestingly that was quite formative for me in generating an interest in in um, all things kind of freedom and peace related but it was a meandering path because really when we were kids the, the celebrities in our culture were the bitterns, avocets, cranes and all the other birds that were flying around and just developed a strong sense that all was not brilliant in the in the environment and set out on a on a journey of um it, it was just following curiosity to try and find solutions that made sense which led to uh, most recently i've been working in finance and financial markets for 13 years which has been a really fantastic forum for learning and trying to triangulate on the truth because you get no points in financial markets for being wrong mm -hmm. um so they're quite a brutal way of learning um and and that journey ultimately cul culminated into uh, a conversation with someone who didn't didn't uh, takes the view that climate change is not man-made or a risk and i i'm on the other side of that debate so we had a really interesting discussion and always i always welcome those kind of conversations um I don't know if I convinced him of, of my point of view, but he definitely convinced me that my solution uh, or, or the, the consensus solution for, for climate change, which is kind of arbitrary tax and subsidy, it hasn't worked for 36 years. It was uh, in 1988 that James Hansen testified to US Congress about climate change. So it hasn't worked for 36 years and it would be a little bit um, mad to expect it to suddenly work now. Uh, and he said, Look, I don't know if climate change is real, but wouldn't it wouldn't it just be treated like any other tort law uh, environmental violation? You know, if, if someone pollutes the water in a brewery, the brewery would not say, oh, don't worry about it. You're slightly subsidizing my beer. So it doesn't matter that I'm selling poisonous beer now <laughs> um, and, and that the polluter is paying a little bit of tax. So that's fine. It, it's um, they have to cease and desist that pollution. And that sounds quite drastic because um you know if, if in a court of law it is deemed that climate change is anthropogenic and and is a problem uh, and it's causing damage to other people's property then we'd need to cease and desist but ironically that would be the cheapest way we could possibly solve climate change because it would just create a market for carbon sequestration and if, if i am sequestering a ton of carbon before i emit one and i'm also capturing the soot and the other pollutants and I'm not harming anyone else. So, so it's it's allowed me to slightly change my, my views where I don't no longer see fossil fuels as the enemy. Um, in some ways, I see the regulators as the, um, as the hindrance to progress on climate change. And I wish we could just get on and, and solve these things in a, from a common law perspective like we have been doing for centuries on, on various topics. Um, so it was really, it was really the, the live and let live movement that I felt captured all of this, captured my my concern for the environment, um, but also seemed to cut like a knife through butter on all topics that were of interest to me. 
like immigration, um, intellectual property, um, just fairness in, in general. And uh, it, it's made me incredibly optimistic about the potential to live in a properly peaceful, free and prosperous world. And, uh, and I think it's more possible now than ever before and probably more needed than ever before as the as the weapons get bigger and um, as some of the uh, existential problems grow and depending on which ones are the ones that concern you most there's different different ones for different people but this this um, the two principles in, in live and let live which maybe we can come on to seem to solve all of those so uh, I've been volunteering with them for three years and uh, it's just been an absolute pleasure great really fantastic people seem to be drawn to it and do you want to just tell people what the two principles are for for living that live? i set that one up <laughs> um the the first one and probably most important is the moral principle which is to be an excellent human and it's the most important but it's also not the mandatory one the mandatory one is the legal principle which is don't aggress. And by aggression, we mean initiating non-consensual physical force against another person's, uh, against another person or their property, engaging in fraud, coercion, creating a substantial risk or threat of harm, um, breaching someone's right to due process. That's a key element, which is, just, you know, so it's a broad definition of aggression here, but a key one, because if we can't just be accusing everyone of of breaching the this rule of don't aggress and sending them to jail if they haven't done something wrong because that itself would be obviously aggression so they need a, a right to a fair trial and then uh, finally breaching contracts engaging in conduct that, that causes harm to another person or um, breaching a fiduciary duty so that's pretty much it um, but we say the most important one is the moral principle because of course we couldn't live in a free society without the the legal principle of not aggressing but we certainly can't live in a peaceful society if all we're doing is not aggressing that's a very low bar you can't say matt and i have a good relationship because we're not coercing each other uh, it has to be we're also being voluntarily voluntarily kind respectful honest trustworthy all those things so i think that's that's maybe a key differentiation with something like libertarianism which doesn't emphasize those uh, those virtues um and we're a bit label shy when it comes to association with with anything else really we're just um we're living that live and it's in the name uh, and uh yeah that's it Matt. yeah no yeah that, i mean I, I i've obviously i know mark victor um um who's obviously the, the the main guy for the project with regards to organizing on an international level um so i'm obviously familiar with the project um itself and it's it's not too dissimilar to to the nations of sanity project in certain elements but there are obviously elements that differ and even a couple of tiny bits that might even conflict slightly but um i mean i suppose nations of sanity is almost like the legal part without the moral part i mean um, and just for anyone listening the nation's insanity project is built on the assertion that crime and law can and should be defined by the concept of individual self-ownership um so basically law should be defined by that concept everybody has right over only themselves that's how we ratify our property rights based on our our ownership over ourselves and that's how we define aggression that's kind of where we draw the line that's the kind of underlying principle of it and we say it should be established as a law through a peace agreement because well we can't do it through a ruling authority because a ruling authority obviously contradicts that very principle that we want to establish as law i.e that everyone has a right over themselves and if you have a ruling authority that is claiming rules based on some authority they have over other people then that's obviously a contradiction of that underlying principle so in that sense the nations of sanity is very similar to the live and let project but just taking one half of it if you like um not to say that i don't have a lot of respect for the moral aspects of you know let's be good people and let's actually it's almost like i kind of um sort of say that the the non-aggression principle which is kind of similar to the live and let live principle legal principle if you like um i know live and let live don't really you know closely associate with libertarianism libertarian terminology um, and I think there's good and bad elements to that. I mean, the good element of it is I think it helps you cast a wider net. 
Um, but I think the, the potential downside of that is you might miss a few actual libertarians along the way, which who you could, you know what I mean? So it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, um, like the live and let live principle is almost like a rebranding of the non-aggression principle in a way that's a little bit more inclusive because it doesn't have that perhaps stigma that libertarianism may have for some people. Um, and also because it connects to the moral principle as well as the movement goes, you're also casting a bit of more of a positive net because it's not just that low bar you say about, you know, respect my rights. It's also about let's actually be nice to each other. Let's go a little bit beyond that. It's kind of like the difference between the non-aggression principle and the golden rule. They don't conflict with each other. You know, the, the golden rule, for people that understand, um, for people, I'm sure everyone knows what the golden rule is, but it's basically treat others as you would want to be treated. Now, the non-aggression principle is very similar to that, but it's kind of like a lower base of it. It's like, we just don't violate their rights. Now, you might want more than just people not violating your rights from your fellow man. You might want them to help you when you, if you need help, or you might want them to work with you, or you might want to be friends, you might want to have a lot of mutual cooperation. None of that's demanded by the non-aggression principle, and none of that's demanded by the live and let live legal principle. Um, it's just, that would be, but, but it also doesn't conflict with it. It can just, you can just build it upon top of it. It's almost like the non-aggression principle is the minimum that we kind of sort of, like you say, that basically essentially demanding of people because we will use force if they kind of violate that standard whereas we're not going to use force against people who aren't nice enough to people um, that's upon themselves um, I remember having this conversation with a religious person and using the kind of golden rule as an example by saying well look you know there's a difference between like you know um, the behavior that you might consider a sin but you could also consider is their because you know in their religious belief god gave them free will it's still their right to commit the sin even if you would want to do everything peaceful to kind of stir them away from what you would view as sin you know what i mean and that's the thing we can kind of encourage um this more subjective morality of what is good and what is to be good to each other um in lots of peaceful ways but the only time that we can actually use force which is where obviously they say the legal element comes into it is when you're actually violating people's rights, when you're actually aggressing. And I, I, I mean, I do personally think if there is one misstep that the live and let live movement does do is perhaps in your description of aggression, I think self-ownership needs to be mentioned or self-autonomy or however you want to word the fact that we have right over ourselves and I don't have a right over you that overrides that. Because I think we can kind of define aggression from there. I think that gives us our foundation. Our, that gives us our like one plus one equals two that we can then work out more complicated sums with regards to how we define aggression. Because although there are genuine grey areas and the approach to grey areas is an area where I've had disagreements with, certainly with Mark, um, although Mark has like to sort of say that because the live and let live project has a very big umbrella um it's not necessarily a disagreement with live and let live overall but more perhaps his own personal kind of approach to a certain element but there is gray areas and there are you know approaches that we can discuss on how to approach gray areas but i think there's also a lot of black and white that people mistake for gray areas because they just don't want to think hard enough about how the principle applies in those situations if, if that makes sense you, you raised so many good points there. I'm just looking around for a pen because I'm not going to be able to remember all the things. But I think first thing to say is that there's, there's two real reasons that we define and um, draw attention to the moral principle. Because to your point, it's kind of obvious. Who wouldn't want to be excellent humans or at least aspire to that? And like, who doesn't wish, wish for that? But, you know, first of all, it, it does allow us to have a, a greater hall in which lots of groups can gather you know as as uh, you can probably infer from an environmental route into this um i sympathize with a lot of people who who care about those social and environmental topics and i think if we're going to win them over um that that focus on on the moral principle is a really helpful tool and frankly i think that that is the essential target audience if if liberty is going to thrive in this world but maybe more important the reason is to differentiate from the legal principle because all conflict in politics stems from asserting our inserting our morality into the law i might say look i think alcohol is really bad for people and i think it's something that doesn't it it, it um 
degrade society. I, I wish that it was banned. And then I enforce that on everyone else. And then other people are understandably unhappy about that because it's their body and they, they want to choose what they put in it. Um, and so we create this conflict. Whereas we, we're saying with the moral principle, look, we really, we really think that you should be tolerant of other people. And we're explicitly saying that. But if you want to be intolerant, if you run a, a, um, a garage that's changing uh, oil for, in people's cars and you want to exclude whatever group it is, if you want to exclude Christians, you just have a thing about, against Christians. Well, as the person who's the steward of that business, he set it up and founded it and put, it, put their energy into it, you know, we would defend legally your right to do that. But we'd be very clear that it's not a good example of the moral principle. Um, and I think that that is the key differenti differentiation because I think we have to allow people with different moral views to coexist if we're going to have um, peace. Yeah, no, I agree. And um, funny enough, I, I um, wanted to speak. You said a few things yourself, and I obviously forgot to address the pollution element. <laughs> um, getting a pen all right no worries <laughs> um yeah I, I wanted to um address the pollution element as well because you made a good point with regards to you know there's a difference between you know admitting a little bit of carbon into the air as we all do when we breathe <laughs> um to you know um poisoning the local lake or you know toxifying the air that we breathe in our environment you know and and, and doing all of these things where or you know or causing whatever knock-on effect um that has direct you know, property damages or damages to people, persons or their property. Um, so, and again, I think both what the Nations of Sanity project proposes and what the Live and Let Live proposes with regards to that kind of legal principle is about drawing that line and saying, okay, well, now you're infringing. You know, you know, perhaps we would want, you know, a higher standard than just not harmful pollution, but it's only when they cross that line where we can kind of point to the harm that we can really sort of say, OK, well, now we have the right to actually stop you doing what you're doing. You know, um, a, a parking lot where there could be a lovely park might be unseemly. But if that parking lot in itself isn't you know, causing an issue for anybody or infringing on anybody, then it's not a problem. Um, so, for example, um, I mean, a good example I often use is imagine you were a farmer and you had like a... Um, you know some crops that were growing and then somebody wanted to build you know a farm next to you or a little house next to you or whatever they wanted next to you it was like okay well there's nothing you can do to stop them they're not infringing on you but let's say they want to build a giant sort of tower that essentially blocks out the sun to your land and prevents you um from you know then then they're violating, you know, then they're infringing on the property or they want to create a big sewage system and they're going to be pumping toxic air into the air and, 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 you know, and all the risks, all of these things, that's when they're kind of crossing that line. And I think it is, it's important, as you say, to segregate, you know, that kind of moral, we think you should do this as, as a virtue kind of thing from that you're not allowed to do that kind of legal principle element. Um, but it's also important to help define that legal element with regards to the underlying principle of, okay, well, are you aggressing? Are you violating anyone? If you're not hurting anybody, then, and uh, I think Mark has even put it this way when he's described live and let live. He says, if you're not hurting anyone, then live and let live. You know, that is, that is the kind of thing. Um, but I do think it is also good. One of the things I like about live and let live project, which, is where it's different from the nations of sanity, but in a in a positive way, is I do like the positive element that's added to adding that moral virtue to it. You know what I mean? Rather than only being about the non-aggression principle, um, sort of saying, well, let's go a little bit above and beyond that. Let's emulate, you know, like I said, something that's a little bit more like the golden principle or the golden rule um, of actually, you know, being a positive influence on people rather than just not harming them. Because that is, as you say, a very low bar, but that is the bar that we can violently defend. Whereas any bars above that with regards to gradations of moral virtue, we can't violently enforce. And I think a lot of people would argue that, if you were to, you would remove the, the virtue of it. You know what I mean? It's like if you give money to somebody, you know, charity or whatever, um, then that's a virtuous act. If you're forced to through socialized taxes, 
then you've you've been robbed of your virtue. You've been robbed of the kind of goodness that would have come from you voluntarily doing that. Plus, such systems inevitably become corrupt when they're using stolen money and the the you know the meritocracy and the accountability all goes out the window. And you know, there's lots of utilitarian arguments, but just from a basic moral element, we've robbed people of the right to help each other by forcing them to to help each other in the rare ways that you know, taxation and such things do actually do that. Although obviously, as I say, a lot of people will point out that most of the time they don't even do that much. But, you know, there is obviously obvious ways in which they do. You know, we all pay for the roads collectively that we all drive on and all the rest of it. Um, but rather than being, you know, forced to do it through taxations, there's a lot of, you know, voluntary ways in which that could be done that would be... And also the other thing as well, I think people kind of forget... Um, and I don't want to give you too much but here, but um, one of the things that people often forget as well with the whole voluntary funding of things is they think, well, if we're not robbing people through taxation, then it's either charitable donations or we're not going to be able to do it. And I'm thinking, well, no, because if you, if you pay for your meal at a restaurant, that's voluntary in the sense that you didn't have to go to the restaurant. But it's not voluntary in the sense that you have to pay for your meal. Like you can't demand free food from the restaurant, you know. So it's it's kind of like that element. So, I, I mean, I often point out to people like, you know, you can still have, for example, regulated markets. You just make them voluntary. So you make it so that people don't have to operate within a, a, a regulated market, but they can. So, for example, the, the business, I can't remember the business you used about that wants to discriminate. I can't remember the example you gave, but whatever the business is, say they want to, you know, not serve some, whatever group or whatever, they could do that in an unregulated market. But let's imagine there was a regulated market that they could voluntarily be part of. But if they were part of it, they'd have to agree not to discriminate against those groups or, or what have you. You know what I mean? And there may be advantages to being in a, in a regulated market and there may be disadvantages to being in a regulated market. I know if I'm buying, you know, groceries and the food for my children to eat and stuff like that, unless I'm getting it all very locally from sources I can trust on a kind of personal verifiable personally verifiable level i'm probably going to want some kind of regulated market for them to be operating in i'm probably not I, you know i mean i don't i don't buy my milk or my whatever from some random guy on the street not that there's people selling it like that but you know what i mean it's like i'm not going to go to the black market for these things because i don't need to um, and in a truly free society the so-called black market as it's currently known i mean if it's if unless the activity is itself somehow criminal in some real way you know like child trafficking or something like that you know but if it's just something that's not regulated then it wouldn't shouldn't shouldn't be criminalized and people can you know there's no there's no reason why i can't sell tomatoes that i'm growing in my back garden to my neighbor and there's no reason i can't do that on a large scale and not be part of any regulated market but obviously if i was part of a regulated market then i would have to abide by whatever rules it's like being part of collectives and stuff where um and that's kind of one of the things i would love to see Whichever, either one of our movements that achieved it or any other movement that achieved this, I'd love to see that all of the um, coercive collectives we have simply be transformed into voluntary versions, which would change them very drastically, obviously, all in good ways, I might imagine. And some of them would disappear entirely. And the ones that would disappear entirely should do, because if they can't exist outside of a coercive system, then they shouldn't be existing um, anyway, so sorry, I kind of went on a little bit there with a lot of different <laughs> tangents, but uh, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, there was loads of good stuff. I'm just starting where you left off. The voluntary regulations, of course, will continue existing. I mean, they already do exist now. I'm pretty sure the Accounting Standards Board is, is like a, an industry body. It's not, it's not um, necessarily, I don't think it's run by a government. So, and that works extremely well, and it sets a common language for financial reporting that works extremely well um, and because it's industry run it's always optimized for the latest thinking it's not it, as far as I can tell it's totally uncorruptible and uncorrupted it works extremely well and it's very good at creating that common language um, whereas uh, you know I think um, the the industry the the um, the capture from um, forced regulation is, is incredibly common. I once met a CEO of a defense company and she said that her main job is lobbying 
uh, um, in Washington for, for like basically more war. <laughs> Um, and it just kind of blew my mind. I was like, I can't believe you said that in front of me. You don't know who I am, but <laughs> you think that's that you think that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, and then your point about the the positive framing on on live and let live, I think, is really a good point as well. We're we're deliberately not against anything, um, which is a big difference from uh, again from libertarianism, which is clearly against the government we're not against the government we're, we're very pro peace and if a government can be peaceful bring it that's great good for them um same with corporations and then your point about the there is no morally good action if it's forced it's not there's no there's no such thing as a forced gift uh that's just a theft um and uh, c.s lewis has a good quote on this which is without freedom there would be no morality um you sort of saying the same thing. Um, and then, yeah, the other benefit about discrimination is that then you know who the you know who the racists are. So that that garage that um, is excluding Christians, well, if you're a tolerant person, you just go to the next one. You just and you, you don't give them their business. So it's not only going to be the Christians that they miss out on. It's going to be anyone who is tolerant. Um, and so these businesses that discriminate um, it's much better to have it out in the open. Let's know who the the, the prejudiced people are because they've got something wrong in their head, or, or not. You know, let's. I don't know, but they're, they're probably not going to do better than the ones that let everyone in through the through the doors. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I often find um, both when I've spoken to people that are, are fearful of, say, like you know, like white nationalists, for example, and people like that being able to have too much freedom with regards to their voluntary association where they can create little businesses and, and even communities that are kind of you know discriminatory discriminatory in a way where they're not stepping over that non-aggression principle violation they're doing it all peacefully ways um but they worried about the kind of consequences of that and i've also spoken to actual white nationalists who you know kind of talk about the dream world they would have if they had that freedom kind of thing and i think both are kind of um are a bit deluded in what their their expectations of what would happen because yeah give them that freedom to do that because that's a two way street that discrimination is a two way street and they th and they think they'll just be segregating from people who aren't white but they won't they'll just they'll be segregating from everybody who doesn't think like them which is most people and you know what I mean so I think the kind of cutting off thing that I think they'll be cutting their own um, nose to spite their own faith face and I want them to have the freedom to do that I and yeah like I say I'd much rather just because they because the thing is the same argument and I've, I've had these kind of debates with sort of white nationalists who've said oh well why should I be forced to you know pay for you know a black person or whatever when I've got these views you know through the socialized system and I'm like yeah and we don't want to pay for you mate you know what I mean it's like it's it's this you know I, I want that same freedom I want your freedom to discriminate on people based on their color because I want the freedom to discriminate on you based on your vile views you know what I mean it's like totally and and so I think that that would almost be so I that's my message to both the the people who fear how people like that would potentially prosper in a free society and the people who think like that who think they would you know their way of life would prosper in a free society i think they're both very very wrong and i think they would see the opposite occur i think i think in fact i think the biggest thing that's breathed life into racism more has been all of this over coming down on people to it to the degree where people get their backs up and people that would otherwise perhaps wouldn't be so tempted i mean it's not that it's an excuse to I think you're an idiot if you let any kind of contrarianism drive you to become a racist when you wouldn't otherwise be. But I do still see it happening. You know, a lot of people are that stupid. And, you know, you some, say someone ha expresses concerns about immigration rather than having a conversation with them about it, you just call them a racist. They'll just, oh, well, maybe I am then kind of thing. And then they'll kind of double down and, and go deeper into it. You know what I mean? And, and you know, I think that's a, a thing that we've seen you know, uh, on, a, on a kind of cultural issue. So I think, you know, in addition to what we've already spoken about, about the fact of, you know, drawing our line where our rights end and begin and end with regards to what we can force on other people, I think also when, even when you're kind of 
Um, although I think that point in itself is valid, you know, because we don't have the right to say stop a racist from being racist unless he's doing it in a way that's actually violating someone. Um, but I think also, I think taking that approach is the best way to defeat these people. Because I think in a truly free society where I think that would encourage that meritocracy, you know, because that's the other thing as well, like when you have like forced um, affirmative action and things like that. Again, that just breeds more racist beliefs because then people think that every successful black person only got there through some reverse discrimination, as they call it, which is just discrimination. I mean, I've, I've always found the the phrase the phrase reverse racism is weird because it's like well it's just racism isn't it i mean you can swap around the colors but it's not reversed it's still the same thing isn't it it's not you know so it's how, how can you be ageist sexist and racist in one sentence is to blame the world on old white men yeah well yeah exactly exactly but yeah and it's the one time you're not called any of those things but yeah, <laughs> yeah. um so yeah um so yeah i mean and i do i think that's that's an important element where I like to kind of tip my hat to the to the live and let live movement with regards to this kind of positive addition that they put on the basic foundation of the non-aggression principle. At the same time, I haven't been tempted to change nations of sanity in any way to, to follow suit, partly because I think both our projects would be better if we're offering something slightly different because we are offering the exact same thing. We might as well merge and be the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, so I think there is that element. I think, you know, it's it's important to kind of, if, if, you, if I think this is the best path and you think that's the best path, even if they're very similar paths, where they differ, I think, well, we should both explore those different, you know, kind of paths. And But I'm very supportive of that difference. That's one difference I'm very supportive. Um, one of the things I'm perhaps less supportive of is, is where, where um, Live and Let Live movement does differ is I feel like sometimes the umbrella they cast is too wide um to the point where and and i don't know if we want to get into this because we probably haven't got time really it's probably something that deserves its own debate and i don't even know what your opinion is on this because this is only again this is what i mentioned before about this is a disagreement more that i had with mark victor but doesn't necessarily represent everybody involved with the live and let live project but this is the approach to gray areas so like for example i said before um, you know, I think a lot of grey areas aren't grey areas when we actually do the, the work of thinking them through. But I think there is still areas, you know, like there's still like things like aged consent and, you know, exactly where we draw the line with regards to harmful pollution or, um, you know, and, and, you know, things like that. How, how I, I, you know, the whole thing about my right to swing my fists ends at the end, you know, the end of your nose, but it doesn't end a millimetre from your nose. I can't just do this in front of your face, you know what I mean? It's like, but I can stand 30 feet away from you and say air box and I'm not threatening you, you know what I mean? And where do we draw the line? You know, so there is a genuine kind of grey area. Um, and Mark's kind of um, approach to that was to kind of say, well, let's have communities decide. And although this isn't something that defines the Live and Let Live movement, it is obviously something that the Live and Let Live movement incorporates as a possible approach. And I'm very, call me a purist if you like, but I don't like that approach because for me, it's stepping outside of the non-aggression principle in regards to giving arbitrary authority to a to a community, what, what is a community? It's just, you know, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a nonsense. We wouldn't let them violate the black and white, which, you know, even Mark agrees. Um, but he's saying, well, but let's give them the kind of authority over the, the grey areas, because it is a grey area. And, you know, um, but my point is, is I still feel like we can take an objective self-ownership driven approach to the grey areas, because even if the self-ownership concept doesn't tell us exactly where we should draw the line in the gray areas it does tell us if it is an agreed upon gray area who has that slight addition of authority so like some of the examples i gave was like with parents on age of consent i said basically you know we can draw our lines and say okay well this is definitely too young you're a child and this is definitely too old you're an adult short of some mental handicap you have the right you know of of, of self-determination all the rest of it but there is this gray area in between and i say okay well the parents get to decide within that gray area because at the end of the day they are the rightful guardians so it's not just me arbitrary saying oh i think they'd be the best people it's me saying from a rights point of view they're the self-owning individuals that brought this child into the world that have a duty of care over them that other people don't necessarily have like they have a duty to take care of that child to feed it and all the look after it until it can look after itself so within the gray area it's up to them to decide 
again, only within the grey area, when they can do that. And, and there's lots of other elements, like um, another example, I don't think it was pollution, but this could apply to pollution, but I think Mark used like a noise complaint. Oh, no, it wasn't, sorry, it was an explosion radius. Say someone was storing explosive in their house, and I wasn't, you know, it was grey area because I wasn't quite happy with the blast radius, so it could be a danger to me or something, but it's grey area or whatever. I'd say, well, okay, well, that would be down to who was there first. Because you can't move to a nuisance and then complain about the nuisance. I can't move next to an airport and then complain about the noise of planes. But if I live somewhere and an airport got built next to me, then I can complain because I was here first. So that was my kind of, and, and I don't expect to kind of, you know, necessarily feed a debate all these issues here and now. Um, but think, that's just an I example. Think we can do it. Okay. I think right, we cool. can. I think we can tick it off. Okay. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> Let's try. Um, so I think you know our our clear vision is global peace freedom and prosperity and uh, for peace to truly exist in society we somehow need to accept differences of opinion and also learn how to co-inhabit and though i think you're definitely right on some things and, and let's take the age of consent maybe we could figure out a mechanism that has some clearly defined boundaries that everyone can agree on. I still think there's going to be topics, and I think the age of consent is still going to be a hard, a hard one to get consensus on. But um, there are going to be lots of different topics. Take intellectual property, animal rights, um, to your point, like all the arbitrary distances and, and like how how much what really constitutes a threat and all that kind of stuff. Um, so for us to be a successful peace movement, we need to figure out how not to not to pretend that all of those can be solved, or at least that's what our, our perspective, but that we need to figure out a way for us to peacefully co-inhabit and maintain our different views. And I think the lowest friction way of doing that is to allow local communities to set their own frameworks and policies on, on that kind of stuff. Um, and therefore, anyone who is totally anti-abortion can live in Norwich, where everyone has agreed to be anti-abortion, whereas those that are pro-abortion can go to Ipswich and live amongst people that, that are really clear that that's correct for the, from, the, from their perspective. And those two communities can be totally in agreement on the fundamental principles of live and let live, which is they can't initiate violence against each other because these are clearly areas where where um, in good faith reasonable people can disagree and, and by the very fact that we can have a reasoned debate it shows that, that there's disagreement possible um, and and perfect maybe is the enemy of good if, if we want to live live in a peaceful society in our time um, and I think it's the the Tower of Babel myth is is a useful one in the sense that we are we, we speak different languages we, we have different moral codes and and we need to somehow learn to um, coexist on that tower rather than have it all crashing down because of some differences. The other benefit is that ultimately um, it's not just going to be Ipswich and Norwich. It's going to be all the little villages around it that, that have got little nuanced perspectives. And, and they're going to be competing for the best framework that, are, that maximizes peace, freedom and prosperity. And... And really, it's going that the early movers to those communities are going to have a massive advantage of opt of of if they do find the optimal solution, because it's going to mean that other great people are attracted there. Their property prices are going to go up. Their their local economy is going to boom, and so you have this kind of free market approach to all of these um, different kind of moral issues that makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that, Matt. Yeah, I do understand where you're coming from, but my my problem with it is it involves an arbitrary authority, even if it is only over grey areas. Now, um, I mean, just to use the the, the 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 age of consent example, like with regards to saying that, okay, and again, I'm I'm clarifying this is within what we're calling the grey area because I do think that yes, we need that we need to draw a line because the thing is we've got to understand that people are going to have different opinions and interpretations are going to differ and all the rest of it, and I do understand that, but I think we need to draw like a limit of tolerance over 
differing interpretations. We need to have a line in the sand at some point, otherwise we lose the distinction entirely. You know what I mean? It's like one of the um, kind of analogies I often give, and I've even got an article titled where the desert meets the grassland. And I, to kind of use this kind of, I say, well, look, you know, you've got a desert, you've got grassland, and you've got an area in between as you walk from a desert to a grassland where it becomes more arid. And it's like, well, okay, but at a certain point, the, 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 you can use the definitions of a desert and the definitions of a grassland to draw lines in either side where, okay, we're well now we're definitely in the desert because all the characteristics that define a desert exist here and it's only a desert and all the characteristics, vice versa with the grassland. And then the in-between area, we can define it as a truly grey area because there's genuinely elements of both there's genuinely conflicting elements there's like there's patches of sand but there's also patches of grass it's you know it's kind of it's 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 arid grassland or it's desert with a bit of very sparse shrubbery you know what i mean it's kind of like it's in that in-between stage so it's like okay well what we can do is we but we still we can still acknowledge there's that gray area but we still have to draw the line you know for the black and white so what i'm saying is is okay well once we've done that how we approach this gray area okay there's no you know we like and like with the desert and the grassland the definitions of each don't tell us where we draw the line in between it just tells us where we can draw our limits of tolerance of saying okay we're beyond a reasonable doubt here we're in desert we're beyond a reasonable doubt here we're in grassland but we you know it's debatable here and people have different ideas and all the rest of it well although those definitions don't tell us where to draw the line in there it does allude to where if anyone has a higher authority, like with the age of consent thing with the parent, I gave my reasons why the parent has the right in the grey area. So they don't have the right to enslave their 30 year old child and not let them have freedom of an adult. Who's, but they also don't have right to sell off their six year old to marriage or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like So we don't let them cross that line. But when we admit that it's a grey area, we have to say that, OK, all the, we're basically all other things being equal we don't know how to decide this, but all other things aren't equal because that parent is the rightful guardian of that child. They have a duty of care that is based on the same self-ownership that our other principles come from. So using that same principle, we can say that the parent has the authority within the grey area. Same with the, um, like with the pollution or the noise complaint or the explosion radius or whatever else you know, we might consider a grey area with regards to like neighbours encroaching on each other. It would come down to who's there first absent of some kind of general agreement that's already been established, like buyer's agreements and stuff like that. But, you know, all, all of those things being absent. Because that's the thing, there are a lot of free market solutions to these problems that don't make them as big a problem. But I still think when we're, when we're talking about the foundation that we have to work within, our limit of what we have the right to do and what we don't have the right to do, my point is, is a community has no right to tell me within the grey area when my child has reached age of consent. But I do have that higher right. And a community doesn't have the right to tell me that I'm causing a nuisance to my neighbour who moved in after me after I've already established this activity. Or if I've got an airport, they don't have the right to move in after I've established my airport and say that I'm causing a, new, a noise violation in their property that wasn't there when I established... You know what I mean? So my point is, is giving it to the community is your... It's, it's very subtle, it's very small, and I can understand why it seems like a very expedient solution. I do get your arguments and I get marks. But my point is, is I don't want to, you know, the whole give them an inch, they'll take a mile thing. And the devil's in the detail both kind of come into my mind as pertinent phrases here, because I'm like, it might only be a little bit, but you give a quote unquote community this supremacy of rights that's not based on self-ownership, that's arbitrary, it's like I feel like it's opening the door, even though it's only within the grey area, I just feel like it's kind of stepping over the black and white by the fact that you're giving them authority within the grey. And, and just one final point before I kind of, I'm interested to hear what you've got to say, obviously, um, but like with regards to how that community is formed, if that kind of community is formed by the people that were there first, then that's not about them being community. That's about them being there first, which comes back to my thing of you can't go to a nuisance and then start dictating to people. But if they were there first, again, if it's a grey area issue. So and, and even to use something as simple as the person swinging their fist, if I'm walking towards you swinging my fists, and it's within that grey area of whether I'm actually encroaching in your personal space. It's not close enough to be 100%, you know, threatening you, but it's perhaps, it's, it's debatable. 
okay, well, you walk to me. So I'm the one who has the right to stand my ground and say, okay, you're getting too close to me. But if I walk to you while you're doing your little air boxing thing or whatever, and then said, oh, now you're doing that too close to me. It's like, well, you walk to me. I didn't, you know what I mean? So it's this, I know it seems like a simplistic way, but the principle for me is consistent. And I'm just, I know it seems puritanical and I, and I do get the whole perfection can be the enemy of progress argument i do understand where people are coming from but i just think this is an issue where we don't need to go the arbitrary route we don't need to kind of let us because there is a principle-based solution and i just i'm kind of I, I drew my line in the sand on that so as much as nations of sanity and live and let live movement have a lot of synergy that's the kind of one area that i see of a conflict where and mark's not saying that this is the way we have to do it to you know that's why i wanted to say that this isn't saying that live and let live are demanding people go the community way they're just tolerant of the fact that we could do that way and i'm not tolerant of that i feel that's a violation of the non-aggression principle and although i do want to be tolerant to different interpretations i feel like that's stepping over the line because it is in my view and i'd be interested to hear what you've got to say but it is in my view arbitrary and i know we've got to finish soon so maybe a part two no would be good but but let me know what you think of that in the last yeah so, the like, i think to, to kind of um to give you uh like to strongman your your perspective if you take something like the age of consent what we could do is we could say of all of the civilized democracies <laughs> maybe maybe there aren't any but like you know let's take um the top 10 in the sort of genie uh free you know the freedom index whatever it is um and let's say let's take the range maybe top 20 the range of consent in there so maybe it's like uh 15 to 19 roughly 15 to 20 or something and we say that that's the gray area because it clearly is the gray area and anything below that is clearly a, an aggression and anything above that is clearly the aggression um then we could let you know we could adhere to that and then they say look the parents are the ones that uh, decide in that gray area but i find that much more difficult for lots of other topics like abortion where you could say i i've heard extremely compelling views that of course, a, a fetus is a living thing, and therefore killing a human living thing is clearly a violation of the uh, of the um, legal principle to not aggress. And then, but you as a steward of your body, going back to your first point at the beginning of this call, um, having that kind of, uh, that stewardship of your, of, and responsibility of your body, if there's a trespasser in there, well, then you have to do your best to, to keep that that being alive. But ultimately, you are allowed to take it out at any point. It's your body. You can do, you can have in there what you want and you can choose what you don't want in there. So these two completely logically um, fair arguments can't coexist. You know, one has to be in your in your mind. I think one has to be right and one has to be wrong, whereas I find that really difficult on, on lots of topics. Uh, and therefore, I think it creates conflict to enforce everyone to do one of those two things. OK, um, I mean, I know we've got to finish in about well, let, about five minutes. So um, and I don't think we've got time for an abortion debate in that five minutes. Um, so, I mean, I, I, do, I will say now I'm very much keen to have a part two of this conversation um, if you're up for that. Um, yeah, I think there's plenty more meat on this bone, evidently. Um, but just all, quickly, all I would say is there is still a grey area in abortion, but I think it needs to be shrunk and down to what is genuinely the grey area. So yes, there is an argument for saying a fetus is a living being. Um, and there is an ex argument about like, you know, women's bodily autonomy and stuff like that. But I don't think there's an example, for example, that sentience begins at conception, when you've just got a cell or two cells or three cells. So I think like the pro life side of, of the debate is wrong on that one. But then I also think that the pro choice one is wrong with regards to the saying, well, it's my body, but self ownership has never allowed you to harm another. And you can't call the baby that you put in through your voluntary actions, you know, unless you're obviously, I know this would exclude instances of rape, but um, whether it's an accident or not, isn't the, doesn't, wouldn't change the fact that out excluding instances of rape, it would be your voluntary actions. And if I dragged someone into my home, say I dragged a paraplegic who was on life support into my home against their will and plugged them into my thingy, then decided I didn't want them in my house anymore. I can't just unplug their life support, kick them out of the thingy. I've killed them. You know what I mean? I don't, my right over my house, and I don't get to write the call of a home invader when I'm the one that brought them into my house. You know, they had no say in it. So, so I do think, although there is a grey area, because 
you know, is it when the it does sentient life begin when the central nervous system first develops, when there's a heartbeat, when there's sort of identifiable brain function? And I still think we can draw a line where we can say, okay, at this point, this is definitely a, like a being. There's definitely a being there. It's not just a clump of cells. So, and that point, we've got that beyond reasonable doubt where we could say prevent an abortion. But before that, we couldn't. And then it would be if, if it's in a grey area, like, well, some people think there is, but some people think there aren't. We can't prove it. Then the mother's body, mother's choice, because she has that. You know, like I say, I think you can always bring it back to self-ownership, One, both with regards to reducing the grey area to what it truly is, but also with regards to how you deal within the grey area over who has that higher authority once you've got it down to that. Um, but. I don't, I mean, Matt, I want to hear a rebuttal, but I don't know if we've got time for it. <laughs> um, let's see. So I think if we, if we imagine the world in which uh, we, we try and find these, uh, these fixed lines where the desert, in fact, has become the grassland. Um, the trouble is because, like, I, I kind of agree with everything you're saying. It's, it's, um, it's very sensible what you're saying. But there, as we both know, there are lots and lots of people that would be either more on the desert side or more on the grassland side. And it's pro it may even be the majority of people that are more, more outside of that, of that kind of sensible middle ground. And therefore, I think it is going to create conflict. So what will happen is, let's say we say that, you know, after three months or five months or something, or let's say after four months, the, the fetus is, uh, is deemed to be um, worthy of the human rights that, that of uh, you know the negative right to not not be aggressed against um then ultimately may, maybe there'll come a time where the, everyone that disagrees with you uh fights for power and then we, we're back to this um forcing other people forcing their morality onto you the sensible middle ground person so i think i totally get your point like you know looking at the american history these little chinks in the armor, these little tiny leaks in the bucket can lead to the mega state that we now have um, from such great initial intentions. But I, I actually do think that there could be a chink in, uh, I think the mega state could be born out of, of the, um, the more um, trying, to, trying to find that arbitrary line in the sand as well. I think there's just, just as much risk there. Uh, whereas I think we're probably going to have to learn to to coexist with these different views, and um, it's just just my perspective. But you gave me the last word on that, Matt. That's very kind of you. <laughs> no problem. Well, I know we've got to wrap it up for a hard finish now, so I just want to say I really appreciate this conversation. Um, if you're up for it, I'm very much looking forward to a part two because I think. I think we've done half a conversation here in regards to what, you know, a lot of things further conversation. Are, um, so, yeah, um, I, I look forward to speaking to you again, um, but I really appreciate. Um, I'll put some links, any links you want with regards to the Live and Let Live project, as well as yourself, um, so people can, you know, find out more about the work you're doing um, and the project that you represent. Um, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Cheers, Matt. Real pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you.